Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our fifth and final session about fluidity, in which we've explored the flow of life as we feel it in our bodies and as it moves through our relationships and the natural world. In this final session, we'll be looking at what I call the universal body, and I'll explain what I mean by that in more detail shortly. But I'd like to take a moment to review one of the benefits of the mindful biology approach to meditation. And that is the way that it helps us meet the world with less sense of separation and aloneness and a feeling of greater connection and support. In this series, we've looked at a few ways that biology can help us soften our experience and meet life with more equanimity and ease. One thing that's very clear from biological research and research into the ecology of the world is how all organisms are connected through the flow of oxygen and energy and carbon and many other substances and many other interactions. There are predator-prey interactions. There's the overall structure of a food web. And we're part of all of that. And so there's a sense in which our body does not begin and end at the surface of our skin, but is really a product of and connected with the whole ecosphere. Feeling connected in that way with the world at large can be quite a pleasant and stabilizing experience. So as we explore the universal body in this talk, perhaps you will notice how it leads to greater feelings of connectedness and safety. So our topic is and has been fluidity. And our specific topic this time will be what I'm thinking of as the universal body. My framing of the universal body is that it's that body of experience that we have when we feel seamlessly connected with and part of the universe. Now, you know, when does that happen? I think one time it happens is when we're in nature and we really feel that sense of awe and wonder and immersion. And I believe it happens during many uh, so-called mystical experiences. I've experienced it a number of times and I'm experiencing it more and more as I develop a practice that promotes this quality of feeling immersed in and part of the universe. So I do believe it's something that's both accessible to us and something that we can develop through practice. So this is the fourth of the bodies that we'll be talking about this term. There was a fifth I mentioned in passing that I'll come back to in other terms, uh, just so we don't overload things. So for a moment, I want to go back to the three we've already covered, the objective mammalian and cellular experiences. So the objective body, to focus on that at first, is the body that comes to mind when we separate our sense of where we are and who we are from the body and then look back upon the body as if it were an object in our field of awareness. That is to say, we objectify. So I like to call this function of mind that delineates objects in the environment and then looks at them and analyzes them, the objectifier. Okay. So this is the body of science, and it's also the body of appearance you know, when we look at how we appear in the mirror and so on. But in fact, it goes further and in a certain sense encompasses all of the bodily experiences we've talked about so far. In the sense that when we feel something in our mammalian experience, that's a direct feeling. But the minute we start to name it and talk about it, it becomes part of the objectified body. And so it's both the mammalian body and the objective body at that time. And similarly, when we feel the energetic quality of cellularity, 
That's a direct experience that we have in the body, and then we also objectify it. So the body has a sense in which we're feeling it directly and a sense in which we're conceptualizing and objectifying it. And we take all of that together, the objective and mammalian and cel cellular experiences, and in a certain sense, the whole thing is our body, all of it. And that's in distinction to what we typically call the mind. So there's the supposedly rational, coolly detached mind, and then the body with everything that goes on inside it and that we think about it. So this brings us to the famous mind-body dichotomy, right? So there's a objective mind that feels as if and thinks as if it's separate, and then a body that is composed of all sorts of different experiences, both objective and subjective and so on. Now the two are clearly in continual communication and resonance through nerves and hormones and so on. So it's really artificial, in fact, to think of the mind as distinct from the body. This is one of those dualisms that in spiritual practice it can be helpful to question. In reality, what we call the mind is also part of the body, because after all, it's a function of the brain in a certain sense. Now, we can also say that the brain is very strongly influenced by the mind. And so the usual framing is something like mind-body or body-mind as a unit. This is how people often talk about this situation in modern parlance. But it's very clear that this quality of having a body and having a mind and the whole experience that goes along with that is largely, if not entirely, a product of cellular activity, particularly in the brain, but also throughout the body. So this flashing display that's moving around in the background is meant to represent all of the cellular activity in the body that generates this experience of the body-mind. So that body-mind that we are so familiar with, you know, that we were in it all the time, in fact, it really constitutes who we are in an important way, it's out in the world, and it's meeting the waves of circumstance that come into our sphere of awareness. And some of these waves are harsh and difficult, and somewhat aggressive, and some are calm and smooth and more benevolent. But the waves are coming and going, and the body-mind is responding to circumstances as they arise. So, you know, if the circumstance is harsh, aggressive, we respond one way. And if the circumstance that comes our way is more organic and sweeter, the body-mind responds in a different way. You know, this is all basic. Now, the important point here that is going to start to move us in the direction of the universal body is to notice that not only is what we call the mind actually part of the body, but so is what we call external visual and auditory experience. So we have the impression of seeing a ship or a whale off in the distance. And we assume there's something out there, but our experience is a visual one, which means it moves through our retinas and our visual centers in the brain before it elaborates into a full-fledged conscious experience of a visual scene. And all of that cellular processing that goes from retina to brain is an internal, that is internal to the body, experience. And so the ship is in a certain sense inside of us because the experience of it depends on cells that are inside and likewise for the whale. Even something very vast, like we look up at the night sky and there's this Milky Way galaxy up there and it seems very far away and very separate from us in a certain sense. 
and yet our experience of it, the visual fact that we can experience the stars, again, comes to us through a lot of visual processing. And in that sense, is a product of cellular activity in the body, within the body. In other words, an entire galaxy is in our body along with whatever ships or whales or people or trees or hills or houses we see or hear or experience in any way. All of it is a bodily experience. Now it's the body in resonance with whatever is out there, but our experience of the whole universe is occurring within these bodies. And this is what I really mean by the universal body. That not only are all of our thoughts and feelings and sensations in the body, but so too are our perceptions, our experiences of the world. That is to say, the world itself is in the body as far as our experience of it goes. And, you know, for the most part, for simplicity, we could say that it's in the brain. You know, it really is more broadly distributed than just the brain, but the brain is the major player. And to make things easy, well, for the rest of this talk, speak of it as if it's happening in the brain, this experience of a world. Okay, so let's circle back to the quality of fluidity. So one way that fluidity comes into all this is the fact that the body, and particularly the brain, have a lot of water in them. The brain has more water than the body as, as a whole. Uh, it's about 75% water. So fluidity can be looked at when we talk about this universal body as the fact that all of this experience of the universe is happening in the very watery brain. So that's one possibility. Another is that there's a lot of flow of that liquid that's in the brain. So there are large blood vessels that flow over the surface and then plunge down into the substance of the brain and all those billions of nerve cells. So down in the tissues of the brain are these dense networks of capillaries that bring blood within a very short distance of every one of the 80 billion or so neurons that are in the brain. Now we saw last time that capillary beds can be regulated. They have these little sphincters that open and close. So we look at them open as they are now and the blood flows diffusely through the whole capillary bed. When they close, the blood bypasses most of the capillaries and flows down the central shunt. And they might close in response to a less active region of the brain. So some region of the brain isn't needing much blood right now, it's not doing much processing, and the capillaries become relatively more constricted. But let's say this particular area of the brain is suddenly needed and it comes online, as it were, and starts to use more oxygen and nutrients. Well, the sphincters can open up and the blood flow can then diffuse broadly through the capillary bed again supplying these more active neurons now that they need the extra supply. This change in blood flow in the brain is what gives the signal that we see when we look at functional magnetic resonance imaging scans such as this one. So these scans are color-coded to show relative blood flow in different regions of the brain. The areas that are gray have a sort of background average level. The areas that have the warmer yellow and red colors have more than average blood flow at this moment. And the ones with the cooler greens and blues have lower blood flow than average at this moment. Okay, so this particular functional imaging scan was taken while a person was practicing an improvisational jazz piece on a piano. So presumably the state of mind was one of relative calm and ease. 
And so we can say this is one picture of a brain that's calm and at ease. You know, another brain that's calm and at ease might look quite different from this, but this is what this one looks like, at least at this moment in time. Well, if something were to suddenly happen, like an angry person were to come in and start complaining, the blood flow in the brain would change because of course, what was happening in the brain would change. Areas that weren't being used much before might need to come online and areas that were online when the person was happily playing music might go offline. And so the distribution of blood is altered and perhaps dramatically. Now, I made this second image by simply reversing the colors on the first. So this is a pretty artificial, not a realistic example of how the blood flow would really change. It's simply to make the point that it would change in some way. You know, we don't know exactly how unless we do the study to see. So some harsh circumstance will have a different effect on the brain than a more pleasing one. Well, of course, circumstances are coming and going all the time. And that means that the pattern of blood flow in the brain is changing all the time. As different regions become more or less active, as different circumstances come in and demand different responses. Okay, so this is just an ongoing fact that the relative blood flow in different regions of our brain are changing moment by moment. Well, as they change, they change our experience of the world. Because after all, if the brain is creating our experience of the world, then when its states change, so does our experience of the world. And I think, you know, we have noticed this. So if you're feeling really happy, you've just spent time with somebody you really love, and you're very cheerful, and it's a nice day outside, and you think about everything that's going on in your life, and it will feel pretty rosy, and everything will look pretty nice often. And instead, if you just got some bad news and the weather is cold and you're feeling sore and achy and uh, you're frightened by the news you got, and then you look around and the world will appear differently, even though maybe the outer world hasn't changed much, but your experience of it has due to these changes in the brain that are partially reflected by changes in blood flow. So we have this world and we have a brain and while it is true that our experience of the world is a product of brain function, it's also true that the brain and the body are heavily influenced by the world. To begin with, they grew out of, evolved out of the earth, out of the universe. So there's that sense in which the earth flows into, feeds into, and supports the brain, body, mind through evolution. And of course, our bodies are also dependent on the earth for all sorts of stuff, like air and water and food. So that's another sense in which the earth flows into the brain and influences it, and in fact, creates and sustains it. Even the more human aspects of our experience, the family, the education, the towns we live in or have lived in and so on, you know, naturally, when we think about it, it's obvious that those two come out of the earth and are yet another way by which the earth flows into us and influences our experience. And then there's what we've talked about a couple of times now, these more intense experiences that we refer to as trauma. And those too come to us because of changes and, and circumstances in the so-called external world, in our families and in our communities and in the natural world, you know, natural disasters, things like that. There can be trauma on all these levels and often is. So there's a lot of ways in which the state of our brain is determined by circumstances in the earth and the universe, even as our experience of the earth and the universe is dependent on the state of the brain. Well, what we have in our experience really is a kind of flow of consciousness. William James used the term stream of consciousness. And what we're looking at here really is the stream or the flow of consciousness. 
Okay, so our states are constantly flowing and changing as we've been exploring. And as they flow and change, they create an experience of the world. And yet the world is also playing a role in setting up our state of mind. So the idea is that as our states change, the world seems to change, but also as the world changes, our states change. And as we know, we can become less tossed about by circumstance through the cultivation of meditative skill. We can become more equanimous, more able to maintain stability despite chaos in the outer world. That's one way in which the state of the mind can be somewhat uncoupled from the state of the world. But there's another that is less satisfying, and that, again, is this effect of trauma. Because one of the effects of trauma is to make us more rigid and lock us into a particular state. So that even when circumstances change, we're kind of stuck in the one that traumatized us. And there are a few ways this can manifest. As I mentioned, you know, a common one is to be relatively unable to experience pleasure. You were sort of locked in fear or grief or resentment or frustration. And even when circumstances become more amenable, our state of mind doesn't change much because the trauma has made us more rigid. But we could also learn from trauma that it's unsafe to authentically express grief and sorrow and anger and move through the world with a rigid facade of happiness, even when we're facing really truly challenging circumstances. So there's just this loss of fluidity, this loss of natural and organic response, this resonance between state of mind and state of world. You know, so we're looking for a middle ground where we're responsive to the state of the world, but we also have independence from it so that we can maintain a measure of equanimity when we choose. You know, when we feel like we need some refuge, we can find it in our state of body mind, even if the world is chaotic. But we want that to be freely chosen. We would prefer not to be locked into it by trauma. Because what trauma does is it gives us an ongoing and persistent experience of a kind of harsh and difficult world that needs a rigid and unyielding and unchanging response. At least this is how I look at it. I mean, there are probably lots of ways to look at trauma. This is one way and, and one that I like because it helps me. Well, you know, going back to the universe. So this world, however we conceive of it, is a fairly latecomer in the history of the cosmos. The universe has been around some 14 billion years and the Earth has only been around for roughly five. Life around here for maybe three or four billion years and human life, you know, for at most a million, civilization for, you know, 10, 20,000 years. I mean, like a minuscule amount of time. So one thing we can do is get a different perspective on our world if we want to soften this trauma rigidity. We can take this really long view and realize whatever hardship I'm going through right now, it's really, really temporary compared to the age of the universe. And millions, if not billions of other people are dealing with their own hardships. And I can maybe begin to look at things in a little bit softer light. I can also remind myself that a lot of the experience that I'm having is actually internal to me. And it could very well be that even if I'm having a rotten experience right now, that it might be more a memory of some past traumatic situation. There's every likelihood that some of my responses now are not appropriate to the present day, but are leftovers, sort of habitual, rigid responses from earlier times of my life. And as I bring all that to bear, that long view of billions of years of time, and the remembrance that I can't always be sure that my perceptions and my evaluations are accurate, I can begin to restore a sense of the world just being the world, with a lot of circumstances flowing through it and not have a fixed viewpoint on things, either rigidly pessimistic or sort of stubbornly optimistic. Well, it's possible to go yet further. We can remember that 
on both sides. So the world out there and the body-mind that we think of as in here, all of it is a product of and part of the cosmos. All of it is flowing. And so there isn't a real difference between what's inside and what's outside. And the sense of looking through a window or through some sort of spectacles is a convenient but artificial experience. That the window is no more meaningful, really, than a plate of glass in the middle of the ocean. There isn't really a sense in which one side is different from the other. We could be on one side or the other of the glass and, and feel like there's a difference, but of course the water's flowing all around. And we're immersed in all of this, we as humans. Okay, we're just immersed in this, not often giving it a lot of thought, but definitely caught up in the flow, the fluidity. And as humans, we do flow. There is a flowing quality to our movements, to our lives. So the fluidity is all around us, right? It's in the brain, it's in the so-called outer world, it's in our biology, it's in life. And all of it is mediated by our body-mind, and all of it is arising from the universe at large. And so it is both conceptually quite reasonable and experientially quite possible to feel that our body is in fact the whole universe. I mean, surely there is a difference in a sense between what's local and intimate to me and what's happening in a country that I maybe know almost nothing about and the people there, you know, they're having their experience that seems quite distant and separate from mine and yet they are human, they arose from the earth, their brains work pretty much the way mine does. Their lives flow just as much as mine. And I can actually take in the idea that they exist with a honoring of the fact that we're all in this together and that they are no more separate from their environment than I am from mine. And because that environment is ultimately the earth, that we are intimately, fluidly, and eternally connected. It really is possible to experience life this way, both in a conceptual and in a direct feeling way.